Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts a Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant, back with another video for all you. For real, for real. And I watched the video on the Halifax explosion and somebody suggested that I watch this video. The Halifax explosion and the Boston Christmas tree. Uh, I guess there's some correlation between Boston in the, in the U.S. here and the Halifax explosion. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what I'll go on with this one. The American Christmas Tree Association estimates that around 77% of American households, some 96 million of them, will put up a Christmas tree this holiday season. And when you think of the tradition of Christmas trees, the first thing that comes to mind is probably not a massive explosion. But in fact, one of the most famous Christmas trees in America is intimately linked to one of the most devastating explosions in human history. It's a story of great tragedy and great heroism and great generosity that goes to the heart of the very meaning of Christmas. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Halifax is the capital of the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, including a large natural port on Canada's Atlantic coast. The city motto, Imari Mercies, means from the sea we get our wealth. In fact, the location of the modern city on traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq peoples was called in the Mi'kmaq language, Chibuktuk, meaning Great Harbor. That natural harbor was the reason that the British created a settlement there in 1749, sparking conflict with the Mi'kmaq. The harbor, the closest on mainland North America to Europe, did not just operate as a locus of trade on the Canadian Atlantic coast, but showed its value as a military base as early as the French and Indian War in 1754, where it was an important logistical base supporting the siege of Louisbourg. The strategic importance continued in the war-torn world of 1917. By then, the city had grown to include some 50,000 residents, 60,000 if you include the large number of troops, military personnel, and mariners passing through due to the war. Halifax was an important railway terminus, with troops and supplies flowing by rail from Canada and the United States to its harbor, where ships heading to the continent gathered to form convoys, a defense against the dreaded German U-boats. Millions of tons of supplies and hundreds of thousands of troops from Canada and the United States went through the bustling port, headed for the battlefields of the Great War. Among the ships using the busy harbor was the 5,043 gross registered ton steamship SS Emo, Built in Ireland in 1889 and sailing under a Norwegian flag, the Emo was chartered for the Belgian Relief Commission and in December was headed to New York City to collect relief supplies. Emo was supposed to leave the harbor on December 5th, but was delayed as her load of coal had arrived late. By the time the coal was loaded, the harbor's submarine nets had been raised and she had to wait to depart until the next morning. Also transiting the harbor that December was the 3,121 gross registered ton French flagged general cargo freighter SS Montblanc. The 18-year-old Montblanc was owned by the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, the French state-owned line that was responsible for French wartime shipping. She had left New York on December 1st, loaded with munitions, headed for Bordeaux and the battlefields of France. She was to join a convoy headed for the continent that was forming in Bedford Basin, a large enclosed bay that formed the northwestern end of Halifax Harbor. She had arrived on December 5th, but after the submarine net had been raised and had to wait for the next morning to enter the harbor. At roughly 8.45 a.m. on December 6th, the Emo, empty of cargo, was leaving the port, headed for New York, while the Mont Blanc, laden with explosives, was entering the port, having just come from New York. The two ships were passing through a part of the harbor that was called the Narrows. Through the Narrows, ships were supposed to keep to starboard and pass each other port to port. But the Emo first encountered an American steamer, SS Clara, which was in the wrong lane. To avoid collision, Emo moved to port and the two passed starboard to starboard. Emo was then forced even farther out of lane to pass a tugboat. And this meant that when the Emo encountered the Mont Blanc entering the harbor, it was out of position and the two were on a collision course. Wow. The two exchanged signals. Mont Blanc halted her engines and Emo reversed hers, but that caused her bow to swing towards Mont Blanc. The result, the Halifax Evening Mail explained, of a right-handed propeller reversed while a steamer still had headway. The momentum of the two ships brought them together. 
The accident wasn't extreme, estimates are the both ships had slowed to less than one knot before they collided. The damage to SS Mont Blanc wasn't severe as the bow of the emu struck her on the side. The people of Halifax and the city of Cambridge on the other side of the harbor had heard the boats signaling each other and had come out to see what the excitement was about. Most seemed to be wholly unaware of the disaster that was about to unfold. In normal times, an ammunition ship would not have been allowed into the harbor because of the risk of explosion, but that restriction had been relaxed due to the needs of the war. Owing to the explosives, the harbor pilot aboard Mont Blanc had requested a special guard ship to be assigned, but none had been. Typically, ships carrying munitions would fly a red flag to warn other ships of the danger, but the practice had been suspended due to the war and the fear of German spies. The Mont Blanc was not seriously damaged, but its deck included barrels of benzol, highly flammable fuel. The collision had upset several barrels, spilling the fuel across the ship's decks, and as Emo reversed course and disengaged from the collision, it caused a spark, and the benzol ignited. The chief officer of the Mont Blanc would later testify that no human power could have extinguished the flames that almost immediately followed the collision. What's more, the ship's only hose was inaccessible because of the fire. The crew of the Mont Blanc quickly abandoned ship. And the ship drifted towards the port's dock number six. Oh, wow. Other ships, including that a tug and a whaler, saw the fire and moved close to fight the fire with their hoses. The growing number of people watching from shore saw the smoke, but didn't realize what it meant, as the ship did not display the red flag indicating that munitions were on board. But the Mont Blanc was carrying 2,925 metric tons of high explosives. The chief officer later testified in court that the crew of the Mont Blanc tried to wave people away from the danger, but their message might have been misunderstood, as only one of them spoke English. At approximately 9.04, about 19 minutes after the initial collision, the Mont Blanc exploded. The explosion that would come to be called the Halifax Horror was the largest man-made explosion in history to that point. As the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic writes, in an instant, Mont Blanc was transformed from a ship to a three kiloton bomb in a busy modern harbor. The Mont Blanc mounted a 90 millimeter gun on its foredeck, a defense against U-boats. The explosion was so powerful that the gun, its barrel melted, landed more than three and a half miles away. The blast was heard 225 miles away on Cape Breton Island. The tsunami resulting from the blast was 60 feet tall. Every building in a radius of more than a mile and a half was damaged. Estimates are that at least 1,600 people were killed in the initial blast, and thousands more injured or trapped in the rubble. Quickly, fires started from the lamps and stoves and how now collapsed buildings. The Montreal Star wrote, To add to the horror, fire broke out in 100 places, and those who were pinned down by the debris met the most horrible death. The Star continued, The war has touched Halifax. Sorrow and anguish are left in its trail. Where only a few hours ago the most prosperous city in Canada stood secure in her own defenses, unafraid and almost apathetic, there are now heaps of ruins. No one could yet estimate the loss of life and property, and words fail to describe the mental anguish of those who have lost homes and dear ones by one cruel stroke. The crash came as suddenly and unexpectedly as the Zeppelin bombs have fallen upon undefended English towns, and the effect has been the same. The Saskatoon Daily Star wrote, the sea, which had given Halifax its wealth and placed it on the highest rung of the ladder of prosperity, has showered disaster upon the hitherto favored city with as lavish a hand as had ever showered prosperity. It would be too much to try to explain the severity of loss or the extent of the heroism by the people in the midst of disaster. A telegraph dispatcher sacrificed his life to warn oncoming trains of the impending explosion. His last dispatch read, guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. A leading citizen climbed aboard a burning barge, also loaded with munitions, and extinguished the fire, preventing yet another explosion. Halifax had the oldest fire service in Canada and boasted a new motorized American LaFrance pumper named Patricia, the first of its kind in Canada. Firemen of the brigade responded to the initial fire, bringing Patricia with them. When the Mont Blanc exploded, eight men from the brigade were killed outright, and a ninth wow. died later of his wounds. Halifax Magazine notes, it remains the largest single loss of firefighter life in one incident in Canadian history. Fire brigades come from nearby communities, some traveling more than 100 miles by train, only to find that their hoses did not connect to the Halifax water sources. No, no, the other video didn't go into such details as uh, individuals who were affected. It just told about the, the, the blast. That's one reason why I didn't say much through it, but 
through the description of what happened with the ships and stuff like that. But now they get into the real personal stuff about the firemen and uh, how they they exactly they go in there. Now they did talk about the telegraph operator in the other video and how he went back because he was about to escape, but he went back to warn other trains about the explosion and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So that's just crazy, man. To think if we would make something that would help mankind instead of something that's going to explode and kill so many people. I mean, we have enough natural disasters going on already, you know. I don't know, some people said, oh, yeah, war is necessary and all of that. And, you know, I don't disagree or agree with that. Sometimes things come to the point where you have to, you know, do things. But. You know, when a tragedy like this happened, and I was, you know, just watching the video, I wonder, okay, so the, the blasts and stuff happened here in Halifax, but all that munition and stuff was supposed to go to the front lines, so how did it affect the fighting on the front lines, you know, because all that uh, supply, you know, ammunition and stuff didn't make it to its final destination. I wonder how that affected the the war effort, to say the least, because there was a lot of explosives and stuff in there. Halifax was in desperate shape. More than a thousand dead, thousands more injured, fires still burning, and tens of thousands left homeless, open to the elements in the middle of a Canadian winter. Wow. While nearby communities responded quickly, the extent of the destruction required relief from farther away. Calls went out across Canada and the United States. Immediately, assistance came from many quarters, including the U.S. Navy protected cruiser USS Tacoma, returning to Halifax after escorting a convoy. The cruiser was hit by the waves caused by the blast, and seeing the rising cloud of smoke altered course to assist Halifax. The crew of the Tacoma provided security and aided in relief efforts. The ship was turned into a temporary hospital. Many of the initial reports describing the devastation came from the captain of the Tacoma. But one source of relief might have come as a surprise to some. Boston, Massachusetts. As the Boston Globe noted in 2017, the historical relationship between Boston and Halifax was not a friendly one. Nova Scotia had been the location where thousands of British loyalists from New England had fled following the American Revolution. During the War of 1812, privateers operated from Halifax, capturing more than 60 American ships. In 1813, the American frigate Chesapeake was captured outside Boston by the British frigate HMS Shannon. The prize had been taken to Halifax, and the captured American crews interned there. The military force that had burned the U.S. Capitol in 1814 had come from Halifax. And during the American Civil War, the Confederate blockade runner CSS Tallahassee had gotten repairs in Halifax, where the community had assisted in their nighttime escape from the harbor, allowing the rebel vessel to avoid pursuit by U.S. Navy ships. But, the Globe continues, these two shipping towns had more in common than most. Boston was home to thousands of Halifax cousins and transplants, including James Ernest McLaughlin, who had designed Fenway Park. It helped that in April 1917, the United States finally entered the Great War, becoming allies with Canada for the first time. Perhaps as importantly, Massachusetts had, in February, created a committee on public safety. Created by Governor Samuel Walker McCall, the committee was a response to the growing possibility that the United States would be drawn into the Great War. The governor wrote when the committee was formed, I did not appoint the committee with the idea that war was probable. I'm expressing... Isn't it amazing how uh, disasters bring people together? Wouldn't it be great if everyday life bring people together like that? We're so caught up in the rat race of everyday life, because that's what it is, it's a rat race, that we could only think of our own survival. And then when a disaster happened, then we start thinking about other, about others. And I'm not saying that means good or bad or whatever. I'm the type of person that think about other people all the time, you know, but <clears throat> it's the same thing that happened with 9-11, you know what I mean? How the, uh, the new fund and landers helped out, you know, by having the planes land in there and everything, you know? So disasters bring people together and it seems like that's what's happening here, you know what I mean? People are rushing to help. And even when there's a typhoon or a tidal wave, so well, you know, what do you call it, a tsunami somewhere, see people mobilizing. Now, I've had some people here, when something happened, they go, why are they sending all the money there when we have the starving people here, even after a disaster? Trust me, I've heard that here too, uh, from some people who are really nationalistic. 
Uh, but if only we could uh, apply that to everyday life, you know, and start thinking about how other people are living instead of allowing ourselves to be politically swayed to think that, you know, somebody dislikes you when in truth and in fact, like they said, Halifax and Boston was more similar than different. Said it right there in the video. Let's keep watching this. Expressing no opinion upon that point. But I think we will all agree that war is at least possible. And as it is possible, it behooves us to do what we can to get the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where it may, as it always has in time of national crisis, respond very quickly to any call from the nation. If the governor was unwilling to speak on the probability of war, he certainly must have recognized it. The U.S. declared war on Germany on April 4th. The committee had established local committees throughout the Commonwealth with numerous responsibilities, including the medical preparation necessary to meet any emergency. That is, Massachusetts already had in place a system that was designed to provide a medical response to meet any emergency. Less than two hours after the explosion, Governor McCall sent a telegram to the mayor of Halifax, Peter Francis Martin, reading, Massachusetts ready to go the limit in rendering every assistance you may be in need of. Wire me immediately. The mayor was understandably unable to respond immediately. McCall called a meeting with his committee. The committee contacted their connections, and the head of the Boston and Maine Railroad promised a train if the governor could fill it. McCall didn't wait for a response from Halifax. The train left Boston filled with doctors, nurses, and medical supplies at 10 p.m., just 12 hours after news had first reached Boston of the disaster. On December 7th, a blizzard, one of the largest in the history of the Maritimes, struck, and the train was stuck in deep snowdrifts. The rescuers needed to be rescued themselves, but the train arrived the next day, just two days after the explosion. Owing to McCall's committee, the desperately needed medical relief from Boston arrived even before that of other Canadian provinces. The globe quoted noted Halifax historian Thomas Roddell, an explosion survivor. Doctors and nurses arrived from outlawing provincial towns, and substantial help was on the way from Montreal and Toronto. But the first and most valuable assistance came from the ancient foe from beyond the Bay of Fundy. Another train from Boston arrived on the 9th, this one carrying equipment for a hospital. The Boston steamship Calvin Austin, chartered by the U.S. Shipping Board, was delayed by the storm but arrived on the 11th. According to the Canadian military history magazine Legion, cargo included 985 packages of mattresses, 591 cots, 86 bundles of pillows, 200 bags of flour, 115 cases of canned beef, 200 cases of canned beans, 62 cases of coffee, and 26 cases of tea. There were shoes, crackers, glass for windows, roofing, clothing, bread, and even margarine. A second ship was already underway, this one the Northland, so according to the December 11, 1917 edition of the Globe, carrying $2,000 worth of shoes, $4,000 worth of roofing, $8,000 worth of stockings and gloves, and $10,000 worth of rubber goods, $4,000 worth of glass, $15,000 worth of miscellaneous supplies, and 10 heavy trucks that could be used to distribute supplies, valued at $25,000. Noted Canadian author Nellie McClug was quoted in the Globe, even this disaster has brought us closer together. And I have no words to tell you the appreciation of the Canadian people for the willing help that has been given. And the aid continued. The Globe wrote in 2017, and this was only the beginning. Financed entirely by American funds, the Massachusetts Relief Commission continued its clinics and its housing and welfare work in Halifax. Long you know, you know, to hear them speak and say, you know, in these times we come together and stuff like that, I don't know. When I was younger, it seemed to mean more. It seems like every time something happens, politicians or polytricksters use it as a way to market themselves to the people. You know, like they, they'd go bring water, you know, and, 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 and they have to go with it, you know, and they have to stand around and say, look at what I'm doing for these people. No, I want your vote. You know what I'm saying? Of course, this is across the, across the different countries, but just think about it. You see a good deed being done. Everybody wants credit. Nobody's just doing it because it needs to be done on human beings. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's overall. I'm just saying it's, maybe it's just the way here the media reports stuff. Maybe that's all it is. But it seems like whenever a disaster happens, and I know 
on the line, there's always people to take advantage. But it seems like the people in power seem to take more advantage than anything else. It's always, everything is turned political instead of just being a human suffering thing that we're taking care of and forget the politics. You know, because when something happens, you hear somebody say, well, well, this party did this, or that party did this, or where were you when this was going on? Where were you when this was going on? And in the meantime, people are actually suffering. Well, let's keep watching this here. Long after the disaster, a memory cherished by the Haligonians to this day. Among the aid given was the construction of an apartment building to house refugees from the explosion. The building was dubbed Governor McCall Apartments. The website of the city of Boston notes that the apartment building sheltered nearly 320 families, or 2,000 people. And in the wake of the disaster came a Christmas tradition. The city of Boston webpage continues. Many of the Bostonians who found themselves in Halifax for the Christmas of 1917 decorated the hospitals where they worked, putting up Christmas trees and other decorations. A year later, in December of 1918, Nova Scotia sent a Christmas tree to Boston as a thank you for Boston's help after the explosion. In 1971, Nova Scotia revived the tradition with a tree donated by the Lunenburg County Christmas tree producers until 1976, when the government of Nova Scotia took over the donation to continue the goodwill gesture and to promote trade and tourism. Of course, Halifax got aid from all over the world, not just Boston and other Canadian provinces and other U.S. cities were also very generous, but the speed and breadth of the Boston response has never been forgotten in Nova Scotia. It stands as a symbol. John Bacon, who in 2017 wrote a book on the Halifax explosion, was quoted in the Boston Globe. On November 30th this year, the people of Boston will light the Christmas tree, a testament to a time when the worst the world could inflict brought out the best in two countries. I hope you enjoyed this episode of History. Whenever they say something when there was disasters back then, it seems so prolific. Have I gotten jaded, getting older or something? Whenever somebody says something, I go, hmm, I wonder what's his underlying uh, intentions here, you know? It's kind of sad that we come to the point where we're like that, you know? It's kind of sad. But this was quite interesting. I enjoyed that. Thank you for suggesting this for me, you know what I mean? And uh, I'll leave a link in the description for this video, you know, so you all can go watch it without me uh, stopping and talking. <laughs> But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and, you know, some of the humanity that it brings out, man. We just need more of that. And we need it to be, like I said, every day. Every day, people. That's all we want, you know what I mean? Like an everyday thing. As I'm not saying the world would be a better place per se, but i won't be i won't say it would be a, the greatest place per se but it would be a little bit better man let's pay attention to the way we're similar more than how we are different and if the differences are cultural let's respect the differences and if it could help us in some way or make us better people in some way we enjoy those differences we don't always have to make the difference something that makes us have to be enemies you can make the difference, get us to be understanding of each other. You know, that's the way that person is. Okay, that's fine. Like I said, unless it's like inhumane actions, you know, uh, wanting to kill people just because they're different, you know, that kind of stuff. No, the differences that will enlighten us, the differences that will make us a better race, generally. That's all I'm saying and thing, you know. Man, I hope you guys are having a good weekend. Y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.